So welcome um, our young humanitarian students to this video here with me speaking to um, an old friend, uh, the Reverend Chris Hassan, who has um, thankfully said he'll do this interview with us to talk to you. Some of the questions you had after you saw his picture that was shown to you by your teacher with him um, taking part of a protest at the arms fair. So um, hi, welcome Chris, thank you for coming here. It's lovely to be here, especially with you broadcasting from the moon. I really <laughs> like your little studio set up. Very good, very nice. Um, so yeah, this is what a proper grown up looks like, okay? <laughs> Books. <laughs> it's lovely to see you, Bruce. Really nice to see you. Oh, and uh, he's been doing a great job as a teacher with all these wonderful young people. Nice to meet you all. Hello. Oh, yeah, you. right. Questions. So, the questions. The first ones are kind of about you and your life, your job, and sort to do with your religion. So, um, first of all, Safa wanted a little uh, question to say she loves your beard. So that's just, just a Safa to just start us off. Thank here. you. Yeah, yeah, um, I agree. It's a good beard. <laughs> so we had some questions from, one was from Azhar, for example, saying like, what is it that made you want to become a vicar if that is what you do? And perhaps- Oh, yeah, well, yeah, okay. Well, I'll interrupt those first I'm not a vicar, I'm a okay. priest. Okay. And I'm a chaplain to a university, University of Sunderland, a beautiful part of the Northeast. And uh, yeah, what made me want to do, to go into the church was uh, a desire to see um, some real change in society. Uh, I was a social worker before I was a priest and it was nice being a social worker but you were kind of always dealing with individual problems mm -hmm. and I'm quite interested in more community issues and priests have a bit of a role in actually changing communities so that's one of the things but uh, spiritually I felt called to be a priest in the in the church tradition you know you kind of have this being pushed by God into this strange role. And it felt very strange to me. I come from a very working class background and the church felt very middle class. So it felt odd going into the church, um, but I, I couldn't resist that calling. And now I've been a, a priest for 20 years and I love it. I absolutely love it. It's a real privilege. I think it is a real calling for you, especially I know from knowing you at university, you know, like from day one from then. So actually going further back than that, a question from a few students. So I've got Ashfaq and Amira who asked, um, what was it that made you get into religion in the first place? Or what is it about Christianity rather than other religions that drew you in? Well, a very, very kind uh, church community. I was, a, I wasn't an atheist. I was just not interested in church until about uh, the ages of 14, 15. I went to a youth group in the count from the, on the council estate that I came from and where I met Christians for the first time and I thought they were a bit odd but that seemed very kind there was a lot of goodness there and I gradually got more interested in what was going on at a church and uh, it was a prayer actually I was encouraged to pray and I thought what is a strange prayer thing it doesn't make any sense to me but in prayer I felt the presence of God and and at the age of 17 I you know said I was a Christian and was a Christian. I felt something very connected to God through Jesus. So that's the path I followed. But I'm, I work with lots of different faiths and I think yeah, wherever there's goodness and love, there is God. Uh, I've no, I don't think there's anything particularly precious about Christians or Muslims or Sikhs or Hindus or, or even atheists. I, I think wherever there is love and goodness, there is God. And my particular path was through the church. Oh, fantastic. That kind of links to, I had some other questions here from Safa, Tommy and Abida about whether you do support other religions other than Christianity. And in your work, I believe oh, you're doing that. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I'm, um, Zaf is my co-chair of the Sunderland Interfaith Forum. And when I took on the role of chair, insisted it was done jointly with a, with another faith colleague and a, a Muslim faith colleague. So for me, um, you know, making sure that people understand each other's faiths and understand religions and where it's coming from and working continuously towards a common good is really important. But yeah, you know, I might be wrong, but for me, it's got to be one God. If there's, you know, we come from one source, it'll be one God, whatever name it's been given throughout different histories and different geographies. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. So, yeah, that kind of links more now to why we're talking to you today. And that's because of our work we've been learning about nuclear weapons and um, lots of our questions for you. And I'm going to start with Khadija's one. I mean, we're assuming that you don't support nuclear weapons, actually. Would you say that you do or don't support nuclear weapons? And I completely, you don't, you don't completely support don't support. <laughs> yeah, completely, completely support. Because, you know, if you are a person of faith, that you believe in the god of life and you believe that, that life is sacred and we come from the, the source of god and we go back to god so anything that that harms that way of life is 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 wrong or in in, in the christian ter terminology actually evil 
So I'd go as far as say that nuclear weapons are evil because there's no there's no sense that a nuclear weapon can be used as a you know just as a as a small you know deterrent or whatever. It's if it's actually used, it's just devastating. If you look at Nagasaki and Hiroshima, you know we weapons that were used uh, in, inappropriately. Um, Japan was about to um, uh, concede and uh, and you know admit defeat um the tokyo had been completely firebombed and and 90 percent of tokyo had been destroyed they're on the verge of 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 defeat and accepting defeat mm -hmm. and they dropped um the first bomb mm -hmm. on Har hiroshima and it was a almost a punitive act uh and but it was more than that they wanted to see what this weapon weapon could do that uh, yeah they wanted to see it was to see the impact on a city, and what was most fascinating about Nagasaki, the second bomb, is that um, that was that was bombed, that was um, exploded in the air, and again, that was part of the experiment that seen the impact of a nuclear it weapon that had hit the ground, and now they want to see the impact of one that was exploded above a city. Now, this was a country where 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 they were really they were they had given up; they knew it was the end. And it was a deliberate experiment. So for me, even you know, people say, well, those two weapons were necessary because maybe a million people would have died if they'd invaded the shores of uh, Japan. I don't believe that. Japan was about to uh, to um, um, to with concede. That, that, this kind of links to um, something from Katrina and other people was saying. Do you think there's a difference then to having weapons and not using them, and then having them and using them? So would you say, oh, they they're like evil, like you said. So is it even just having them but never intending to use them? Is that just as bad, or or what do you think? Is there a difference? There? Yeah, yeah, it is. I think you, we all, your job is to work to a world without them, mm -hmm. and there is a re reason why why they are there, and it's not a deterrent. It's about building up nation states and building up power within certain provinces, and. and accelerating another arms race all the stuff that goes on behind it mm -hmm. is pushed by the who has nuclear weapons and who has not got them mm -hmm. um, I, and i think there's a, a very simple thing about how how getting rid of them is that if you if you say well we've got to have them to keep ourselves safe as britain's position has always been if you've got that you cannot then stop another nation from from doing it you cannot say well, we can have them but you can't have them you know and, and that's how you allow you know your other country you know, saudi arabia israel whatever pushing to have you know their own nuclear pakistan india but that was probably the closest we've come to third world wars yeah. the standoff between those two nations uh, interesting the only nation that's denuclearized itself is South Africa under Nelson Mandela. Yeah. You know, so so they had the nuclear weapons and under Nelson Mandela's uh, yeah. new post-apartheid government, they decided that actually it was a pointless, wasteful, expensive and dangerous thing to have nuclear weapons and they pulled back from being a nuclear state. I guess that's what um, some of the questions here were about, you know, what about if other countries have them, you know, we, not everyone's going to put them down together at the same time, are they? Well, that, that's that's where you have to, that's where you, you really have to work together to, to, to do that. Is it a very interesting standoff at the moment, obviously, between Ukraine and uh, and Russia? And, you know, obviously the media is very much, you know, or Russia bad, you know, uh, and Ukraine good and all the rest of it. But it's actually not as simple as that. You know, what Russia is wanting is not to have a NATO country with nuclear weapons mm. right on its border, as it already has to deal with in many other ways. Um, and and it's one of its demands is that is that is that Ukraine isn't a nuclear force. And you know, it's interesting because I thought that would be a brilliant thing for if you, if Biden had been a real peacemaker, mm. it would have been a real chance to say. Okay. Well, you know, let's get around the table about that. That's maybe that's that's the nuclear rise that you know Western and Eastern Europe. Um, so there could have been an opportunity to really pull back. So, what but the cost. Of, I mean, the, the thing about nuclear weapons is that is that there's always a danger that they could be used um, by accident. Of course, the most famous story is the world nearly came to an end uh, during the the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, and the um, the world was saved by a Russian. You know, three three Russians on the on the ship, and you had to have agreement of all three before you press the nuclear uh, weapon. They were separated from 
um, the rest of the fleet, uh, a te depth charge had gone off beside them. They thought that nuclear war may have broken out around them. And they, they had a choice of firing their nuclear weapons and starting World War Three, or they were thought just being part of it yeah. or not. And two of them wanted to press the button. And the third soldier, uh, the third commander uh, said, no, we're not going to do it. And he saved the world. Wow. Um, and, you know, it, it's extraordinary stories worth looking up on Wikipedia. But uh, yeah, that was a moment we we almost came to the end of the world. And you know, the, the, why you have nuclear weapons, there is always that risk. Okay. Now, I don't want your your young people to be alarmed. You know, there's a lot of checks and balances to mean that that's not going to happen. The sixties were a very uh, different time politically and militarily. Uh, but ultimately, there's always a risk it's and always a danger. danger. Yeah, there's always going to be that danger. Um, so what about when people say challenge you, for example, a few questions here were from people saying if someone challenged you and said, well, doesn't someone like Hitler need to have violence used against him or someone challenges your view on this? Well, how would you argue with them or what do you what do you say to them? Well, I, I mean, there's a, a world of difference between uh, opposing fascism and militarism and bombing. Um, so are you a <laughs> you, pacifist that you would say that violence is never the I'm answer? Not, uh, my heart says I'm a pacifist. Yeah. My heart is, um, it, you know, in terms of my Christian faith, Jesus was prepared to forgive those who are nailing him to a tree. Mm. And at the heart of the Christian faith is you must always forgive and you must always de-escalate violence. Mm. Um, so it's, so my, my Christian heart, my human head <laughs> is like, you know, ugh, you know, I, I get angry and I want to, uh, you know, defend a child who I think is being bullied or whatever. Yeah. And but but violence will never ever completely defeat violence. It will only probably escalate violence. Mm. So um, nuclear weapons are just the ultimate escalation of threat. And and you know if you've been in any situation like a fight in a bar or or seen a dis disagreement in the street or in the classroom, you know, getting more aggressive and getting more violent never is the answer you must always de-escalate this is this is right from it's from the play cool. from the playroom to all the way to the top and the only people who benefit from getting more ang ang angry more more i don't know more violent are people who are going to make money from escalation you know there are people making that comes to asking about the picture that i've shown my students of you at the arms fair and I, I, could you explain a little bit what you were doing there was that a real exorcism or what was happening there when you did that there yeah for me it's a real exorcism i mean in the sense that for me exorcism is about exercising things that are of evil in the world and the things that are of evil in this world as in exorcising is in getting rid of not exercising yeah, as in exorcising, yes, exercising, getting rid of, yeah. getting rid of things that actually are, are evil and damaging to not just ourselves, but the, 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 the global community. So, you know, I think there's a way of saying you need to exercise racism from communities, you need to exercise uh, uh, patriarchy, misogyny, mm. um, all forms of violence, certainly militarism. The idea of people making huge amounts of profit from selling weapons that are going to escalate a war in Yemen or in Syria or in Ukraine. Um, these are things that society needs to, to get out. And I believe that Jesus want, wants to, to get rid of. There's a wonderful story in, um, in Mark's gospel about uh, Jesus exercising um, a demon called Legion. Okay. And in that, in that story, you know, uh, there's someone who's possessed and Jesus exercises them but it's not about an exorcism in terms of um someone with the spirit really that's just a mask the reason the person is called legion is because they are representing the idea of what happens when you're occupied by an by an invading army the the, the romans the legion of romans in the story the demons are, are flushed into into 2000 um pigs which are then driven into the sea but 2000 was a number of roman soldiers who occupied Gennesaret at the time and very specific things about uh, the damage that an occupation does mm. to to your psyche and jesus actually is, is a story about getting rid of occupation and empire mm. uh, but 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 written in a way that um, 
made sense to people at the time yeah. but also a little bit hidden in a time when when christians were being persecuted by the romans you don't have stories that simply say romans are bad let's get rid of them yeah. um yeah. it's a lot more complex than that so i guess um that kind of links to something else in a minute but i'll come back to some questions we've got about protesting in general yep. so what is it that's made you so hannah wants to know what your first ever protest is you went on others want to know what motivates you to keep protesting any embarrassing things that have happened when you're protesting and then how does that link to protesting about war and nuclear weapons so okay well first first ever protest was up at uh, Faz Lane, which is a nuclear base up in scotland oh my students um, researched that for their homework as well yeah 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 so so that was the first one i think it was lovely to actually when i went up there i was old i was 30 I, when i was a social worker you couldn't protest because you would have got a criminal record or you may have got a criminal record and that would have meant that my working in prisons would have had to come to an end so i didn't uh, become an anarchist or a protest until i kept until I became an Anglican. But when I was trained to a priest, there was a lot more freedom to do that. I went up to Scotland and uh, protested against uh, well, uh, the cost. Went up there, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. I mean, it, it, actually, the, the Trident nuclear submarine or the, or the replacement system is hugely costly at a time when uh, Britain can ill afford that kind of waste. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, for me, as I say, they're, they're evil. That was lovely because there was a big, strong community of people doing it together. And if you're gonna do protesting, you don't do it on your own, you do it in community and that and that makes it more bearable. It was terrifying the first time I'd spend the night in jail uh, in, a, in a prison cell and it was quite terrifying. Um, and then a lovely Quaker, it's, a, it's another Christian denomination, a Quaker came in, guy in his eighties and sat with me and, and prayed with me and made it all bearable. But um, it was terrifying to do it. The reason I, do it keep doing it at times that there's some things that are so abhorrent to the world and the people need to kind of um say no this is wrong um and nuclear weapons and the arms trade are certainly uh, must be up there at the top list of uh, of things that are harmful to humanity and harmful to the world and sometimes when you've gone through the political process you know you cannot get any further so with nuclear weapons the reason one of the reasons that that um got me into, into doing the protesting stuff, physically put my body there, is that in, with the city I was at in, uh, before I went to Durham, where, where I met you, Ruth, was, was Bradford. Bradford had three MPs. And I remember when they were, uh, Tony Blair put in a thing to replace the Trident Nuclear Program. And so I went to lobbied, I went to speak to and write to, and I, was, and I spoke to all the MPs. And these three MPs all said to me, uh, it's ludicrous, it's crazy, it, it's cost too much, yeah. and I personally am against it, and I will I will vote against it. Yes. When it came to Parliament, all three of them voted for it, because the system was like, they had to, the Labour Party was saying, really? you have to you have to vote for this, or you're, you're going to lose a lot of influence, you're going to be in lots of wrongs. So those three MPs, thought, thoughtful, you know, clever people, knew it was wrong knew it was crazy said they was going to vote against it when it came to it democracy didn't allow them to mm -hmm. uh, and that that's when you know people like me begin to put our bodies in the way yeah. uh, of saying that democracy isn't working we can't change this in in through that parliamentary route we have to do something else so with that what's so this i guess is what motivates you to keep protesting so do you feel sometimes that i guess i'm thinking of all the protests i've been on so my my students also looked at the anti-war protest with the, the iraq invasion do you feel that you know sometimes they just don't seem to get the answer we want when we protest what is it that keeps you going if the war still happens or the weapons are still there like what what motivates you to keep going i, I think the world would be a worse place if people hadn't and made a stand. If the, those who make money out of war and make money out of the situations out there and power and all the rest, if, if those people don't have any checks on them at all, then they will make more money and, yes. and, and it would be horrific. So even though you can say, well, we didn't stop the war in Iraq, we probably reduced the ability of Bush to do what the hell he wanted, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, 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 there were some, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of a, a lot of stuff that comes out of the, that kind of protest movement, which which is really good. Mm -hmm. But you no, know, we're up against we're up against you know in, in terms of Iraq, it was about oil, and we were up against huge um, sort of economic and military uh, powers, which uh, small democracies within each country are probably hard to hard to stop. But you can put a check on them, and you have to. And morally, is it's also a choice. You were actually saying. I 
this is not in my name yeah. okay tony blair is going to go and do that and support bush in yeah. invading iraq but it's not in the name of the people and so you know the largest demonstration in british history was you know maybe one and a half maybe two million people in london yeah. to say no we don't want to go to war in iraq yeah. and that probably put a, a big check on yeah. the, uh, some balances on, on what was going on and in my, but heart, no. my heart when i see now what's happening i know if like if my own children were to say to me well, what did you do i'll say well i protested i was there i didn't agree with it you know and i feel like i i had to say something I well just, I, the yeah. same is true of climate change at the moment i mean down to to i'm not always a big fan of that some of the the tactics that are used but i'll be, i'll go down to uh, um to the events in london and and you know part of those those environmental movements because you know it's it's affecting all you who are watching this and yeah. uh, and uh, my kids as well you know climate change is 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 a is a, a bigger threat in some ways than nuclear yeah. weaponry is in terms of our common humanity yeah. in in two three hundred years time and and we ought to care about that and extinction rebellion people are saying look if we don't do stuff you know that's it that we, we life on this planet will become in uninhabitable in in many parts and therefore the the, the pressures on re, the pressure on resources will be unbearable so one last um i'm going to say like big question and then we're going to get onto some more just general questions i've had from people so a couple of people wondered what your view was to do with the israel palestinian conflict i don't know if you could give us a kind of short-ish answer to that i mean i know it's something we could even do a separate video on probably about that but it's something that yeah just yeah about. I, 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 your involvement i've been out in. i've been out there and uh, and uh, and been part of peace groups jewish muslim and christians working together for peace i think it's very hard because there's enough people making enough money from land for the land grabs that are going on in Palestinian lands that um, that it's going to be very hard to overturn that. Uh, it, it's a crime against humanity to have so two million people crammed into the prison camp that is Gaza. It is a it is you know it, clearly it's against the United Nations um, uh, regulations and laws and, and it's very hard to see a, a positive end to this one. It's um, you know that. Um, you have hope that there will be though one day um <laughs> uh one day yes i mean i always say you've got to take the long term with this and you know i grew i grew up in a time when there were bombs going off in london every other day uh and you know we thought there would be no end to the violence in in northern ireland and you know I that was like that about that, apartheid when i was growing up i i couldn't believe it when that stopped yeah now yeah yes yeah. so, learn about in history you know this thing happened so I, I i say never say never um but i think the israeli palestine one is a is a is a, is, a, is going to be a longer conflict than that um you, you, uh, when you were there you you were involved with peace things of like across the board with different types of people yeah i mean because there are many jewish people working for peace and there are many muslims working for peace it you know uh, there are many and there are small groups of christians working for peace um so cpt christian peacemakers uh group out in Hebron it was fascinating to spend some time there and I think all you can do in the face of horror is be beautiful and 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 be kind and show that there is a different way of being mm -hmm. um and I think that, that's a that may be a naive thing but it, sometimes that's a really the only thing you can do and it what what's encouraging is if you go uh, you know to go to Gaza or Palestinian or Palestine is you meet just beautiful people who are doing such incredible things in the face of such a horrific system yeah. and it is actually bizarrely enough quite heartening yeah. to see what human beings are, are capable of when they're being oppressed and there's no I, I refuse to be you know down disheartened by everything going on in the world when I know that people are struggling in much more difficult positions than I'll ever have to struggle with it's also a thing about for me about protest I'm lucky enough to be in a position where I can protest without being shot to death yeah there are many parts of the world where that's not the case so I will make use of my power to protest because I'm very privileged that I have it um that kind of links really nicely to one of Juliet's questions which is what's your favorite thing happening in the world today so maybe something really positive that you love about the world today. My favourite thing, well, that's what, what a beautiful question. Whoever <laughs> asked that question is a lovely soul. That's all yeah. I can say. Um, uh, and well, beautiful things. My two kids, I've got two, uh, a 14 year old and a 17 year old 
uh, kids and they've got their problems like everyone else, but they also believe that things can change. They were involved in the Christian climate uh, uh, climate strike stuff, the, sorry, Chris, the um, children's climate strike stuff, uh, Fridays for Future and stuff like that. And it, it gives me huge encouragement to meet them and their friends from school who who say, well, actually, we want to live in a different world and we're prepared uh, to do something about it. So I, that's that's encouraging. I think um, certainly, uh, you know, Greta Thunberg and 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 you know the voice of young people is is very encouraging though it's not to say that we as older people ruth you know I'll be, you know ruth and, and i yeah we have to do all our bit it's not just yeah. about asking the kids to do it everyone has to do what they can but that gives me great encouragement and um julia also asked if you prefer cats or dogs so i had to ask you that one. well that's an obvious one you know um uh, uh, you know cats are heavenly and, and 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 dogs are a nightmare um so actually i went around to a friend's house and they had a cat and the cat just spent all the time knocking vases off the off the <laughs> off, off things and, and evilly sort of doing it you know it was, it was, it was, a, it was exercising its right to protest <laughs> <laughs> i like jesus upturning the tables i want my food i want food for all the cats um yeah. and then finally i think i'll end on this question was i rude or nice to you when we were at university because i think i've hinted that sometimes i was quite um i had my views and i wasn't always very gentle with giving them so did you find that i was rude to you or nice when we were at university together no you were lovely at university you were a pleasure to know you were a kind soul you were good to the people <laughs> around and you cared about the things that matter and i i'm so glad that you're a teacher to these wonderful young people because what an influence you'll be bless oh. you no, they're wonderful kids. It's a privilege. Well, thank you so much. I shall stop the recording, but we can stay talking for a second. So everybody, if we have more questions, I'll forward them to you. But um, Bye. Bye to Chris.